But tonight, um, we're going to be stepping over into the insect world. I'm really excited about this. There's something like a million species, as, we'll, as we've learned, as we'll learn. Found so far, millions more to be discovered. Millions more to be discovered. That's awesome. Insects are unbelievably diverse in form and function. Entomologist Issa Betancourt joins us tonight for a deep dive into the wonderful world of insects, the author of Backyard Bugs of Philadelphia and host of Hashtag Bugscope, a weekly insect themed live stream. Isa is a photographer and curatorial assistant at the 4 million specimen collection of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And tonight she's zooming in all the way from Ann Arbor. Um, as I turn the screen over to her, Isa will lecture for about 45 minutes. Then I'll be reading your chat questions to her for her response. So feel free to write in the chat anytime and we'll take note of that. So Isa, welcome. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to be here with you and everybody. Everyone's doing well and enjoying the, um, the rise of insects as spring comes to us. So, They're back. They're coming back. That's right. All right. I will share my screen so we can get going. One moment. Okay. Screen shared now. <clears throat> All right. Um, does it look good on your side? Looks great. All right, cool. All right, six legs to rule them all. Yeah, thanks for having me tonight. Um, and yeah, uh, if you guys are not familiar with this reference, it's going, it's a little hat tip towards Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings, where there's this ring created to dominate and give this huge power to the holder. And so, uh, it's fun to think of insects that way because, um, well, as we'll discuss shortly, they are incredibly diverse and you can find them nearly anywhere across our planet. So here we go. Okay. Um, so, so we're going to talk about insect biodiversity and then I'm going to dive into remarkable insects that you can go out and find around Philadelphia. Then I'll touch upon why why it's important to support the insects and then also how, how we can go out and do make a difference ourselves. Um, and so those are the things that we will chew upon this evening, like how this praying mantis is chewing upon the leg of a cricket. All right. So, um, but before we really dive into that, I wanna review what makes an insect an insect. So insects are animals just like you and me, we're all in the same kingdom. And then beyond that, they're also, they're, they're in a different phylum than us. They're an arthropoda, which means they have an exoskeleton, which we do not have, our skeletons on the inside. And then they're in the class Insecta. Beyond that, it goes order, genus, species, and there are a bunch of insect orders. And unfortunately, um, well, some of them you might be familiar with, like beetles, coleoptera, butterflies and moths, lepidoptera, which means scaly winged, uh, and then there's also um, flies, which means two, diptera, which is two winged, di is two, ptera means winged, um, bees, wasps, sawflies, and ants, hymenoptera, net winged insects, neuroptera, and this picture is of a neuropteran or a antlion that's laying eggs over there. And so there's many more orders. I'm not going to get it. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to get into them all tonight, but I just want to flash this on the screen to show you um, there's, there's so much out there. Okay. And so what all of the insects in those orders have in common is um, they all have an exoskeleton, one exoskeleton. They, the body plan is that they have two antennae. And you can see that in the little lace bug here. Um, I mean, the, the net winged bug or the um, ant lion here. And then they have three main body parts the head, thorax, abdomen, they have four wings, they have five eyes, which might be a surprise, but I'm counting the three simple eyes that they have on the top of their head, which I'll show you a closer picture of in a moment. And then they have six legs. So there you go, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six items that you can use to um, classify an insect. Um, and then here is a photo of an Eastern yellow jacket, one of our natives. And you can really see the ocelli, um, one, two, three. Those are those simple eyes on the top of their head. 
And so one compound eye, two compound eye, and then the three ocelli make that five. Um, and most insects have ocelli, but in some cases they are lost or absent because if you don't use it, sometimes you lose it with evolution. So, all right. So what I love about insects, uh, I got into bugs at a pretty young age because I enjoyed going into my backyard and I just loved how I could just find an insect almost anywhere that I went. And that's pretty true wherever you go on the planet. And even Antarctica, you'll find an insect. Did you know that the largest tr primarily terrestrial animal on, or fully terrestrial native animal on Antarctica is an insect? It is a little tiny wing, a little tiny midge, a little tiny fly that doesn't have any wings called Belgica Antarctica. And it's only two to six millimeters long, but it, that is the largest terrestrial animal on Antarctica. Pretty cool. Um, so now I want to challenge you guys and ask you to, in your head or in the chat if you want to, too, up to you. Um, I would like you to think about how many bee species there are living in the USA. So I'll give a moment for you to get that number in your head to think about it a little bit. Um, and then in a moment, okay. So hope you have your number. And now I will share with you that, I see that there, I can't see, I don't know if I can see the chat or not. Oh, there it is. Okay, awesome. Thanks guys for putting that in there and being brave. So the answer is 4,000. There are 4,000 species of bees in the USA. Thank you guys so much for guessing. And if you look at this chart, some researchers back in 2017 put this question out and tried to see and to see what what the thoughts were of bee biodiversity and the number of species. And most people guess under 100, and most people guess under 50, and that's a huge, huge difference to 4,000, which um, which is the number. Um, and so it's pretty wild. So uh, we're, we'll do this one more time with a different group, okay? Okay, and this picture is a picture of a honeybee that I took at Logan Square in Philadelphia. Um, okay, so let's do species of dragonflies and damselflies in the world. How many species do you think there are of damselflies and dragonflies? So once again, get a number in your head. If you want to, you can put it into the chat. Um, I'll give it a moment. We have 5,000 coming in, 2,500. We have a million. Uh, we have uh, Dave saying 1,000, Fiona saying 3,000, Tam saying 600. Um, yep, these are much higher guesses. Good job, you guys. Um, so the number is 6,500. Um, there's 6,500 species of dragonflies and damselflies in the world. And so now let's think about how many species of mammals there are in the world. And I'll, I'll just put that one forward so we can continue on because I have a lot of content to share with you tonight. Um, so the number of mammals in the world are about 5,000 and nearly 5,500. And so just with dragonflies and um, damselflies, there's more mammals. We're not even including beetles here, we're not including flies, we're not including butterflies and moths, um, those other groups, just with dragonflies and damselflies. And it's pretty amazing too when you think about it, like if you, if you do this, this is your homework, just for fun if you want. Like start listing all the mammals you can think of, all the common names, and then start listing all the common names of dragonflies and damselflies. We're just so much more familiar with mammals um, for many different reasons, of course, they're larger and um, fuzzier and yeah, okay, let's carry on then. So yeah, so there's over 1 million insect species described um, by scientists. And a really cool thing is that there are, that's only 20% of the estimated number that there will be in the end once they're all accounted for. So there's approximately 5 million or 5.5 million insect species that are estimated to exist. And that's, um, a number that has been gone fluctuated a bit up and down over the years, but they're getting a little scientists are getting a bit better at honing in on the number now that we have DNA as another way to measure and um, learn about what 
what we're dealing with. It gives us another dimension in addition to just looking at the shape and the form. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and then I'm gonna show another graph, which might be here. Okay, so here's a graph, a pie chart. Um, and on the left side, it's the arthropod phylum, which is uh, the organisms that have exoskeletons and insects, the hexap which are hexapoda, they comprise most of hexapoda, six-legged group. Um, they, you could see, are a big part of that pie. They look like Pac-Man about eating all the other groups. And then if you look at just the insect group, um, you'll see that Coleoptera, that's beetles, Coleoptera, Coleoptera are beetles, that's the blue one, and that is a large, almost half of the pie when it comes to the groups of insects. So insects take up, uh, so beetles take up a, are a lot of, consist of a lot of the described species. And now I'm going to tell you too that there are about 2 million described um, species of any organism on the planet. So that's all organisms. There's about two to like 2.2 million. And so if the beetles are about 400,000 of that, it means that approximately one out of every five described species is a beetle, which has led to um, this um, British biologist who when asked about the nature of the creator back in the day, um, they, they concluded that um, there must, the creator must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. Yeah, so because one out of every species is a beetle. So, all right. And so because of that, that's why, hence the title, insects are a dominant force on our planet. Um, they're, they have a very high species number relative to other organisms. And that's like, and so dominant species is a term that's commonly used in ecology to refer to organisms that have a, a very high proportion of impact and presence in an environment. Hence the ring. So the six legs to rule them all. And then here's another interesting graph that I thought I'd share too, showing biomass. So plants are consist of most of the weight of all the organisms, but of the animals, insects still dominate. So. That's um, the arthropods are that um, red group right here. So um, then you can see humans as well and livestock and wild animals. It's a pretty, pretty cool graph to explore. Um, can we do questions during the presentation or are we waiting till the end, Mike? Um, it's dealer's choice, but we were going to wait till the end, but you sh whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, I'll say if, if you have a question that is like a point of clarification or like uh, what we're talking about right now, then go ahead and put it in the chat. And then, um, but if, if I miss your question, we'll answer it at the end. How about that? Okay. And so one, one, so one more, one more big number uh, example too. So there's, I'm not, not even going to try to say this number, but there's this many insects alive at any given time. And there's, 100 billion stars in our galaxy, which means, if you put it together, that there's 100 million insect individuals. This is not species, actually, so sorry if that's confusing. But it means that there's 100 million insects for each star in our galaxy. So I think that's a pretty cool idea to think about. <laughs> um, oh, so okay. the question is, why do some bugs change colors? And I will talk a little bit about that later because we'll talk, be talking about a bug that changes colors. Okay, so, um, so one more thing about insect species is that uh, one other way to put it into perspective is to think about all the people who flooded Benjamin Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia um, to celebrate the Eagles and the, the football team when they won the Super Bowl. Um, scientists who study and estimate and calculate the size of crowds they took a look at the photos that were taken of the event and calculated that there were approximately 700,000 people uh, present here. And what's pretty cool is that you could hand out one species of insect, one insect description to each person there. We'd still have a huge surplus. We'd still have 30, 300,000 um, insects that didn't have a person to pair up with. So, okay. And where does the success come from? Why, how are there so many of these insects? 
And that, that comes from, uh, they've been here for a long time. So Earth is about three and a half billion years old. Life on Earth is about 3.77 3 billion years old. And um, insects have been around for, and even flying for about uh, over 400 million years. And then the insects that we're familiar with, like dragonflies and beetles and crickets and grasshoppers have been around uh, for about 350 million years. And this is before the dinosaurs too. So they've had a lot of time to um, diversify. And then uh, some of that, that success comes from their size. So this is a tiny little jewel beetle, Buprestidae is the family name, that I collected in Center City, Philadelphia. And it's on the top of my Apple computer, right next to the little, in the curve of the Apple to give you a sense of how tiny it is, only a couple of millimeters big. Um, and so their small size um, uh, helps them find opportunities that larger animals would not be able to take advantage of. Uh, the shorter generations that they have, like insects may have uh, multiple generations in a whole year. Uh, they, they, some have one generation, some might have two, some might have three, four, five, six, seven. Flies have really fast generations, as you might know from combating fruit flies in your kitchen during the summer. Um, and then they have lots of offspring here. And the combination of short generations and lots of offspring allow them to evolve very fast and also to take advantage of resources that are available. And also if a couple die, which will happen sometimes, um, they can still uh, rebound from that very easily. Um, and then the metamorphosis allows them to, as caterpillars, they don't compete with their adult, with the adult form, um, which can be very helpful and um, also allows them to change dramatically to different camouflage or uh, coloration strategies for survival. Um, and then uh, their extra legs can be super helpful because you don't, because you can walk also with four legs if you need to. Um, it makes, you kind of have spare legs in that way you can use for other purposes. Like here, here the praying mantis is using its front legs uh, in a raptorial way. We call them raptorial four, four legs. It's using them to catch and eat up its prey. So, um, and here's an example also of how being small can help open up new opportunities because some really, really small insects are able to go in between the layers of leaves, their leaf miners, to take advantage of this whole other nutrition um, and survival and way, of, and way of life, this whole opportunity that a larger organism cannot take advantage of. Okay. And so that's what led, has led to the beautiful diversity of insects that we see today. Here are some insects that I collected in Center City. Um, back in about 2013, um, and oh yeah, and it's led to all sorts of cool stories and uh, ways of life that are fun to, and interesting to explore. And that we'll be diving into a little bit this evening. So here's Philadelphia, um, our lovely city. And insect life, even in this urban jungle, uh, still manages to find a way to thrive sometimes. Here's one of our annual cicadas that's um, along the, um, uh, the bridge near 30th Street Station. Uh, and so I started, in order to investigate the center city insects, I started collecting insects and scooping them up from the fountain across from the Academy of Natural Sciences. And uh, you can see some of my catch in there. And what I'd do is I'd walk around with my boots and some preservative and I'd scoop up the bugs and put them into a net for safekeeping and I'd bring them back to the museum to be examined and looked at. And sometimes um, some, I'd even get some helpers along the way, which was really fun too. Um, here they are helping me collect some bugs. Uh, so, Swan found has been an interesting way to examine insect biodiversity in Philly because um, it's been there for a long time, which means someone can do what I did in the future and compare what I got to what happens later. Um, and it's also right in the middle of the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. So um, insects will oftentimes use channels or like get caught in breezes. Um, and so it's interesting to have this fountain in the middle of this, uh, this street the way that it just cuts through. It's right in the middle of the parkway. Um, so 
It operates the, it kind of works like some um, traditional entomology collection methods, like a light trap at night for moths, like a bee bowl during the daytime, which tends to catch different types of bees and wasps. And then also like a flight intercept trap because it's in the middle of that um, parkway. And then here's what I, I bring them into the museum and store them safely and add labels um, so they can be examined and used for science. And here's a tray of some of what I've collected. And so we'll take a look, closer look at some of these ones that I found particularly exciting. Okay. Um, so here are six, 16 insects that I found pretty cool that I came across that I want to share with you this evening. So dung beetles. Dung beetles was an interesting one. Here's a little graph that I had put together with some of my findings. And you see a big spike at one, one point of the year in May when I found a bunch of them and then it dropped dramatically later on. Um, these dung beetles, I didn't know that they were in Philly um, until I started this project. Some things you just don't notice until, um, like, because they're just passing through maybe until you stop and start sampling. You can see those front little legs, which they use for pushing um, dung or whatever, whatever resource they're trying to make use of together. Um, and their heads look like little shovels that they use to shovel it around into little balls as well to to pack together um, for themselves or for their offspring. Um, and so, yeah, here are some of, these ones are not native though, these are introduced, but they're still very cute and pretty cool to come across. <clears throat> um, here's one that was interesting to come across. It's a sphingid moth and uh, the scientific name is down here in the corner, uh, Sphacodina ab abati eye. And, um, so while I did get some moths in the fountain, a lot of them got destroyed by the swirling of the water in the fountain. So um, when I did get one that was intact, it was rather exciting. And this one was interesting to get too because um, one thing I like to do sometimes is check what I find online with, there's a site called iDigBio and, and where museums submit records um, and aggregate them so I can see what other museums might have specimens that have been collected and compare them with my own. And then they also have, I also sometimes like to compare observations from bugguide.net and also our naturalists. I recommend you guys check them out if you're interested in exploring insects and in the area and also recording your own journeys of discovering bugs. Um, and I didn't find, I only found one record of this moth on a naturalist and none elsewhere from the Philadelphia area, which was pretty interesting. Um, I also got a cicada that was a pine barren cicada which was also interesting to encounter because it's not near its home. Its home would be in the Pine Barrens. It's not our annual cicada that we do get in Philadelphia. And so it must have just been passing through. And that shows how insects will um, explore. And that's one way that they find new habitat. Um, and then here's my favorite insect, the golden tortoise beetle. And this is a beetle that, um, is the fastest color changing arthropod known to man. I first discovered it in Philadelphia in West Philadelphia when I was walking around and I saw it climbing up the um, a fence. And I like looked closer and I um, then I saw it again and then I caught it in the fountain. And then there's also a whole big population over by Payne's Park if you guys wanna go golden tortoise beetle hunting this summer. Um, and they will, they eat morning glory. Um, so here's an example of the color changes. Oh, next one here. And you can probably guess why it's called a tortoise beetle, right? Because the way that the exoskeleton covers its body and it can hunker down inside when it wants to hide. So here's, it, it's golden when you find it. And then when it gets disturbed, it turns red. And then when it calms down again and it feels safe again, it'll turn back to the golden color. And the sex punctata in the name, Tritatella sex punctata, refers to those dots that you see on the back of its exoskeleton, um, which kind of make it look like a ladybug. Um, they eat morning glory. And so one summer I did, I raised a colony of them. And so here you can see all the different colors, the going from the golden to starting to change, then changing more, and then finally the very red one up in the top left. Um, and yeah, they're, they're the fastest color, 
fastest reversibly color changing arthropod known to man, and it's right here in Center City, Philadelphia, and it's a native insect as well. So, so, so if you have morning glory or any kind of bindweed plant on your property or nearby, go look for them. What's also cool about them is that they, as larvae, uh, he, they're a zero waste beetle as a larva. When they shed their exoskeleton, when they poop, they keep it all and they pile it up into and hold it up with their the um, fork on the back of their body. And it's called a fecal shield, which they use to camouflage and um, try to avoid being eaten, basically. So, um, and it's pretty effective if that's if that's their method. And then as adults, this is the egg on the side over here. The, the adults glue the eggs underneath the leaves. And as adults, um, for winter, they overwinter as adults in the leaf litter. So here's another picture. So you can also see those little, all those edges, which I think are meant to try to keep insects, curious insects away from them, like a little spears, perhaps. Um, and then here's a non, Silly example of how fancy some tortoise beetles can get. This is from when I was in Borneo back in 2015. And this one had a super, super fancy fecal shield. You could see it's making some more fecal shield down here too. So <laughs> that was pretty exciting to see. Okay, so next, next bug, number five is an enzyme wasp. And this one has beautiful blue eyes. We don't know why they're so blue. Scientists don't know why they're so blue. And they're an exciting thing to find and also an unhappy thing to find because the good thing is that they parasitize cockroaches. So they help their natural control for cockroaches. But the bad thing is that if you see them, it means there's probably cockroaches around. This is another thing I found in the fountain. Then there's the cone-headed katydid, which is a beautiful green, um, undecently large katydid that you can find in the area. I got this several times in Center City, Philadelphia. Some beautiful grasshoppers. And I think you guys might be able to guess what this is. This is a lightning bug. Um, so sometimes they end up um, in the fountain as well. And lightning bugs have aposematic coloration. They have a warning coloration with the bright and the dark patterns on their body because they are toxic and they don't want other animals to eat them. And what's so cool about lightning bugs as you might be familiar with is that they shine at nighttime and um, where we use communication with um, body language or with our voices, they communicate with each other with light. So the darkness is important to them. Another pretty wild insect that is in Philadelphia that I encountered in Center City, Philadelphia in Logan Square is the pigeon trimex horntail. And this one has this huge, what looks like a stinger, but that's actually for laying eggs inside of hardwood. And this insect is particularly um, cool, I think, because it has a special gland in its body where it carries a fungus. And when it lays its eggs in the hardwood, it injects that fungus and the fungus helps soften the wood and the tree so that it's easier for its babies to eat that tree. So it's like it's making, it's using that fungus to help it make baby food. Um, yeah. Okay. And then now here's another one from the fountain. It's the punctured tiger beetle. Tiger beetles are the fastest, one of the fastest animals in the world for its size. If you cal calculate in the size, they're one of the fastest along with the American cockroach running in, running animal. And they run so fast that Researchers at Cornell University discovered that they have to stop when they run because they go blind. So they have to run and then stop and then run and then stop. And so you can find these, um, you can you can find these around Philly, but you can especially find a very closely related species, um, uh, which is green in the Wissahickon area. And eventually in the spring, you'll see them running down the pathways and their characteristic run, stop, run, stop, and they'll be bright green. So if you take a look here, you might be able to guess why it's called the, the punctured tiger beetle. If you see all those um, little holes and, and uh, indents in its exoskeleton. Um, then there's the black soldier fly, which is not really native. It's not native to here, but it's native to um, the tropics. 
and uh, but its range has expanded and it, this is an interesting species because you'll probably you might find it in your compost if you keep compost post in your backyard and it's being heavily explored as a, a source for food for animals and then also maybe for people because it's uh so so keep an eye out for that in the future um and then here's one that is just plain cute. It's also not native, unfortunately, but this one was introduced on purpose. There are insects that are introduced accidentally, and then there's some that are introduced on purpose. And I saw a question saying, how does a non-native dung beetle get introduced? And there are dung beetles. I, I, I'm not sure about the ones I showed earlier, but there are dung beetles that get introduced in different parts of the world to deal with dung from livestock. But this one was, in this alfalfa leafcutter bee was introduced to um, help with pollination of alfalfa and some other crops as well. And so just look at that little face, so fluffy. <laughs> um, and those eyes are very pretty even when it's um, not alive anymore, but okay. And then uh, here we have a sand wasp, which is a nice native um, that you can find in the area. And you used to be able to find it in Logan Square, but I'm not sure that colony is existent anymore. Not sure what happened, but I haven't seen it in recent years. What's fun about this one too, is that you can see it digging in the sand, almost like a dog digging a hole. You'll see the sand flicking up into the air as it's um, excavating and making its nest. It'll, par it'll paralyze, this, this species specifically will paralyze stink bugs and then um, provision their nest, put it in the nest for their offspring to eat. And they paralyze it instead of outright stinging it and killing the stink bugs because that way the food stays nice and fresh. Um, and then we have a cuckoo wasp, which is a stunning insect. Uh, this insect is very heavily armored. Uh, that exoskeleton is really tough and it needs to be tough because the, the cuckoo wasp moms, they go into the nests of other bees. Solid, many, many bees have their nests in grounds and they're solitary. And so this one will go find those nests, go inside and lay an egg and its offspring will parasitize and eat the other bees' um, larva. So it's all armored to protect itself from the angry mothers of the other bees. And then we have the monarch butterflies, which I don't get them in the fountain. Um, a lot of Lepidoptera probably evade the fountain because their scales are so hydrophobic. So the water would just bead right off of them and, and it helps protect them when they're flying about from rain, from hypothermia, all sorts of things. Um, scales are the butterfly and moth superpower. It gives them their superpowers. And also it helps them evade spider webs too. Because when they run into a spider web, just the scales fall off and the butterfly flies uh, free. So here we have a nice um, monarch butterfly fueling up on its journey down to Mexico with City Hall in the background. Um, and then what I also don't catch in the fountain, um, but I, what I want you guys all to know about are um, wild silk moths. This is one that people will come across and they'll be like, oh my gosh, what's this huge caterpillar? Or what is this huge moth? Because they tend to be um, very, they're just very, um, the caterpillars are up in the canopy eating tree leaves. Maybe they're eating tulip tree leaves or oak tree leaves, but they're up high. So we don't see them very often until they're down wandering and looking for a place to pupate for the winter. Um, and then the, um, the adults are only alive and flying around for about 10 days because they don't have a mouth. And it's, there's one job is to find a mate and find a place to lay their eggs so their um, offspring can have uh, some yummy tulip tree or oak tree or sweet gum tree, whichever they might be a host on. And so um, if you're curious about exploring and finding these moths, they're very large and exciting to come across, then I recommend going on iNaturalist and looking them up because um, there's a brood that occurs at the end of May and then it happens again around the end of July as well when you might see them because it's only about 10 days that these, these uh, species um, are active as adults. So, okay. And then I have to acknowledge, of course, the periodical cicadas, which are coming to, um, to town, coming, rising up from the depths. Uh, this, uh, this year we have brood X and they will be active between the middle of May till about the middle of June. 
And um, one interesting thing that my colleagues and I noticed with the periodical, periodical cicadas is that we don't have any records in the collection at the Academy of Natural Sciences um, in our collection there. We don't have records that are from Philadelphia of this brood. And we haven't noticed any records on the online resources as well for the Philadelphia area. And so definitely keep an eye out. And if you see them, um, share, share what you find uh, with us or with um, iNaturalist. And then there's also, um, here I put in the comments down here, a cicada safari app that's also documenting their presence. And so this is brood X from 17 years ago. Um, so, I mean, hopefully we'll have a noisy summer. I see Allison is asking, so we will have a noisy summer. Depends on where you live, because there's pockets of these, um, the populations of these in different areas. And it, it's definitely tricky being a periodical cicada because so many things can happen in 17 years to the area that they're on. Maybe like a parking lot goes there and then, um, or maybe they're fine and then you get these huge emergences. So hope it's, it's an exciting time. And um, so, and I'll answer the question too, why 17 years? 17 years, um, there's, there's ones that emerge every 17 years, ones that emerge every 13 years and ones that emerge every seven years. And um, the thought is that in this way, they avoid being having a predator that continuously eats them. So we have our annual cicadas that come out and they don't overlap with periodical cicadas. So there's no, so there's no, there won't be any confusion. And plus our periodical, plus our annual cicadas are green and darker and they have a more like, they have a strategy of blending in with the environment rather than these where they just stand out completely. Um, and so while there are like squirrels or birds that can rely on our annual cicadas for food, no predator can rely on these for food if they're only gonna be available every 17 years. You can't wait that long for your next meal. So, um, so while a lot of animals do eat them, it, they don't, there's no, it helps eliminate having specialist predators um, that look for them and, uh, and then also the huge emergence of them also does something called predator saturation, where they, the, pre, the animals that do eat cicadas won't be able to eat all of them, which also is a survival technique of animals that uh, come up and, um, and kind of explode in population like this, like they do. So very exciting time and I can't wait for it. And also guys, if you're curious, I recommend you try to taste one too, because cicadas taste like pistachios. If you like pistachios, take a bite. Okay, so I also wanna give a little hat tip to some of the invasive species that are notable in the area. Um, we have the Japanese beetle, which is a uh, widespread invasive introduced in the area um, up in Riverton, New Jersey. Um, we have the Chinese mantis, which is also a non-native widespread introduced in Mount Airy. So very, very right, in, right here in Philly, although it wasn't Philly at the time. Um, then we have the brown marmorated stink bug, which was also detected in the area up in Allentown at the turn of um, the, at the, up around 1998. And then we have the spotted lantern fly, which is also, everyone knows about that at this point. And then we also have the cabbage white butterfly, which is also an invasive species. And one time when I was going in between um, Cityland Avenue and downtown, uh, Philadelphia on the bus. I counted from the bus uh, along the highway, along 76, and counted over 200 of them on the side of the road as I went down. They're very, they're the most common butterfly in the USA, but they're not native. Okay. Um, but then I do want to give a little hat tip to some of the natives that might be confused with some of those non natives. Uh, we do have native stink bugs. We do have a semi-native praying mantis, which is kind of native, but it also is a little bit of a range expansion. We, we're on the very edge of its range, but we have the Carolina mantis. And then I also um, wanted to acknowledge these caterpillars, the Eastern tent caterpillar, which growing up, I thought it was a bad caterpillar, but now I le have learned about it and I know it's native and just a part of our ecosystem and um, they're not to be, um, there's no worry. Don't worry about them. Yeah. Let them be. And then also our um, beautiful um, 
uh, scarab beetle or green scarab or fig eater is another name. Okay. Um, so all of this beautiful diversity and recently there have been worries about there being an insect apocalypse. And it's true that um, this is something to pay attention to um, and a sort of consensus by, um, there was a symposium at the Entomological Society of America last year where they talked about this and the contributors to the symposium came to the conclusion that it's a sort of a death by a thousand cuts situation. There's a lot of, it's, we can't pinpoint one, one thing here. There are a lot of issues. There's pollution, there's urbanization, there's introduced species, there's agricultural intensification, insecticides, deforestation, droughts, uh, global warming, all contributing to adding so much pressure on our natural systems. Um, and, and it's important that we care about it. Insects are, um, they serve a big role in our environment and also to us, they pollinate. And one of the most famous examples, um, the, there's, there are beetles that pollinate, there are butterflies that pollinate, there are moths that pollinate, there are um, flies that pollinate and, and no one of those insects can do it alone. It takes a, a, all the diversity to contribute and make it happen. Um, and then there's prey as, as a reason why they're important. Insects are food for birds. There's a, there's a decline in birds and it's important to support the insects because they are food for all sorts of other organisms, including other insects. And then also there are nutrient cyclers, there are decomposers. Here's the rainbow scarab, which is a native to our area as well. And um, this is a dung beetle. And, it, and one thing that I like to think about with the dung beetles is that they basically turn poop into beetle. So if you wanna get rid of poop, here you go, add a, add a dung beetle and then voila, it all turns into beetles and flies away and rejoins the um, food web. So, and then of course there's beetles that take care of dead animals and, and um, it's just, and also decomposes organic matter like your compost or like the fallen leaves, all sorts of things. Hmm. And then there are product producers. So we have insects um, uh, like honeybees that produce food for us. Um, and although, yeah. And then, and also silk, silkworms that also produce um, silk for us. And then also uh, insects are inspiration for technological innovation. Um, they, there are researchers at Cornell who are looking at the way that flies fly and the way that they're able to go upside down on the ceiling. And we, we are not currently able to reproduce that with robotics right now. We can't make a two winged, because flies are two winged, we can't make a two winged robot right now that can do those radical maneuvers that flies are able to do. And so there's a lot that we can learn from the way that insects move. Um, and then they are fascinating. So hopefully some of the ones I shared with you earlier, you found fascinating. Um, this one right here is a tree hopper. Membracity is the family and it is mimicking a thorn. So you might not see it right now, but if you lean away a little bit and squint, you might see how it would look just like a thorn on the right plant. Okay. Oh, and also if you want a monetary value, um, some entomologists calculated that they contribute $70 billion to our economy. So they need our help. And the good thing is that we as individuals can help support them. Um, and you have the power to do that. So how do you do that? Um, if you make a habitat, the great thing about bugs that I love so much is if you make the habitat, they're gonna show up, but just make sure you're making the habitat for an insect that's in your geographical range, of course. Um, so here's an example of, um, I was at the Mary, Marion Botanical Garden in Lower Marion and they had a spice bush um, there. And I was like, oh, like, cool. I wonder what's inside this curled leaf, just leaf just for fun. And I looked inside and there was this caterpillar or like the real life caterpie right there inside that leaf. That turns into the spice bush swallowtail. 
Um, and then there's two approaches you can take to supporting insects. You can target certain species that you're really interested in bringing to, to you, to your yard, um, and then cater to their needs. Or you can do a general approach of planting native and see what comes. Both ways can be very exciting and rewarding. If you wanna do the shopping way, um, last year my colleagues and I put together butterfly guides, which, hope, which have the host plants of each of the butterflies. So if you want to, you can scroll through there and be like, oh, I wanna attract this butterfly and then see what the host plant is and then plant it in your yard and see what happens. That's, that's, that's why it's fun that insects fly. They can fly around and find the food um, and the plants that they need. Um, and so, yeah, it's a nice challenge. So one example of something that I always try to create in the habitats where I am are habitat for my favorite insect, the golden tortoise beetle. They eat things in the Convalaceae family, plant family, so morning glories and sweet potato vines. And here, um, this native uh, plant is um, right here, is one that they eat. And also it's, it's also food for other insects too, like this plume moth that I accidentally got a ton of when I was re rearing my, um, when I was rearing this colony up here, I had a, a huge emergence of these plume moths as well as an accidental exciting um, addition to that, the rearing and uh, clipping of plants to feed the colony. So, uh, and then of course, another way you can support insects is grow a little extra in your herb garden. So there are some other, some caterpillars that um, like the black swallowtail that enjoy eating parsley and fennel and dill. And so when you plant your garden, plant a little extra for them too, because they're probably going to show up. So yeah, plant native plants. Here's, a, here's an ambush bug on top of some goldenrod. Um, and here are a couple of resources that you can um, use. And does the Schuylkill Center have a native plant sale? Yeah? OK, awesome. Yeah, so the, the Schuylkill Center has a native plant sale, so look out for that. And then there's also a bunch of online resources you can use to check to see if the plants you have are native or not. Um, also, leave sticks and fallen logs in your yard. Um, because if you, like if you just walk out into a natural space, take a look at how it looks and you can try to recreate that and see what you draw in. Um, insects are, like, like I said before, nutrient cyclers, a bit, an important part of nature's cleanup crew. It's, it's already built into the system. We do a lot of the cleaning up, but it's already, there are already organisms that want the fallen log to be there and want the fallen sticks and hollowed out sticks. And here in the corner of the screen is a best beetle, which I found at Sedgley Woods, which is the disc golf course in Philadelphia. In Sedgley Woods, there's a bunch of fallen trees. And so when I was there, I lifted up a log and I found a really beautiful best beetle um, that was below. They're really cool because they have a microorganism in their body, sort of like termites, that they pass on to their offspring that help them to break down the wood. And also if, if you, um, bother them, they, they make a sound that you can hear and they go squeak, 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 squeak to let you know that they want to be let go <laughs> and put back. Um, and then also, you'll also find a lot of organisms and insects that overwinter in these spaces. It's really important to leave leaf litter because like I said before, the tortoise beetles, they, they, they are adults in the leaf litter during the winter. Um, and then here, um, I also saw a queen bald-faced bald hornet that was overwintering as well. Um, and uh, I know that some people might be like, oh, I don't want hornets or wasps because they can sting. And I don't have enough time to get into the beneficial traits of wasps right now, but there are a lot of great things. They, they serve an important role in our environment. Okay. So yes, yes, Jeanette. Jeanette says, thank you. I will never, never have to rake again. Yes. Yeah, so one of the big things is we need to change the concept of yards across America. We need to change that concept to support um, our wildlife, which in turn supporting our wildlife and the environment is how we, it supports us too. So it's just, we're all connected. Okay. So, so I'm giving you those three things, make a habitat, make the habitat. I didn't really talk about chemical use, but long story short, um, one of the most effective ways to deal with mosquitoes is just dumping containers that are catching water in your yard. Like that's, that's one of the most effective ways. 
Um, and then also start conversations and celebrate your insect friendly yard with a sign. It's so important to share it and spread the word. It can be a simple sign like this, or you can also get certification through um, other organizations. And so, yeah, insects are the gears that keep our world moving. And I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation. I'm looking forward to answering whatever questions you guys may have. Lisa, thank you. Really appreciate that. That's wonderful. I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, it's just about eight o'clock now, or we'll be in a moment. But so we'll we'll answer questions as long as you'd like to stay, and we're happy to have you. Um, just so next week, next Thursday, we're doing uh, a virtual wildflower walk. So come join us then. And then two weeks, ask a naturalist any question you want. But uh, we're going to go into the chat. Uh, Amanda put in um, the chat um, our native plant cells. So yes, we're having one. It starts next week. It'll be on our website. Um, uh, when you go into the, the, the top page, you'll see it on the homepage, but, um, but do check that out. So let me go to the questions. Here they are. Um, we had an early question a long time ago about um, metamorphosis. And the question was about whether butterflies are the only ones that do that kind of metamorphosis or do other insects do a kind of radical meta metamorphosis, right? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. Um, beetles, like a lot of other insects do it too. Um, beetles, for example, are one that do that. And uh, like I was mentioning before, the best beetles, they live, they live in a group with other best beetles and they also live even with their grubs sometimes as well. And that way they're able to pass on this, those um, microorganisms that help their offspring break down um, the wood. But yeah, beetles go through complete metamorphosis as well. Ladybugs come in a little grub form before they're an adult. And, um, but other insects go through a less dramatic metamorphosis, like, yeah. All the flies have a pretty good metamorphosis. Right? Oh yeah, that's a good one too. Yep, yep. flies, fly eggs. Um, Ed yeah. saw holes in the ground with the 17 year cicadas. Did the nymphs use the holes? Oh, um. Or they can't, that's where they emerge probably, right? Yeah, yeah, you will, you can see emergence holes from them because they're really pretty sizable, so. And then he saw the 17 year cicada skeletons attached underneath the leaves. Is that typical? Yeah, so you'll see um, you'll see the exoskeletons that are left behind when they shed. That's them going through their metamorphosis from they go through semi uh, hemi, hemi they're hemi metabolists, which means uh, it's like a less not as complete um, as like as the transformation of a butterfly, for example, where it goes from a caterpillar to a pupa to the adult. And so as, as the nymphs, they have these little wing pads. And then when they come out, um, when they molt, they pump up their wings and then they harden and they're able to fly. So there's an author you probably know about, Doug Tallamy. Um, he's written yeah. about the importance of nature, uh, of the importance of native plants in gardening. And uh, I saw a lecture from him two weeks ago, and this is wonderful. So just one oak tree in Pennsylvania will be the host plant for more than 500 species of just Lepidoptera, of butterflies and moths, 500? I mean, that's just crazy. And yeah. what happens is the caterpillars are up there in the tree, right? And when they wanna become pupae, um, they come down and find a place to go crawl away and pupate. And so what happens, he says, is um, they come down and sometimes it's just a lawn where they get mowed. So what do you, you know, when you have, you wanna plant an oak tree, he calls it one of the keystone species, uh, for native plants, um, put some nice little garden around it that's native plants and put, pile some rocks up and things like that. So when caterpillars come down, they got places to crawl into and under. So I thought that was a wonderful. Yeah, I, I definitely recommend checking out Doug Tallamy's books if you're looking more for how to support bugs because they're excellent. Yeah. Laura wants mosquito advice. Oh, what in general? Just mosquito advice question mark is the... Mm, okay. Um, my mosquito advice is to, when you're looking for solutions on how to deal with mosquitoes, look to your government organizations um, at what they say to do. And what they're going to say to do largely is to go into the backyard and dump and drain all the man-made containers. Because the ones, the ones that are most pesky, the Egyptis, the 80s Egypti, the day flying one, it's, it's specialized on humans at this point, and it's specialized on breeding in man-made containers. So bottle caps or um, anything that might, that can Just catch a bottle cap. Yeah, <laughs> enough, a bottle cap is enough. 
And how many uh, days does it need in that bottle cap? Uh, I don't. Not long. Know. Do you know the answer? I don't. I'm not sure off the top no, of my I head. No, I don't. But I, I don't. I can say that I'm gonna have a um spy, a mosquito scientist entomologist on my live broadcast on the 22nd of April. Oh, good. If you want to come ask that question then? Good, good. Yeah. Okay. Um. Erin said your book is sold out on your website. Any chance it'll be restocked soon? Um, yeah, I, I <laughs> definitely am looking to do that this summer. Here's my book, you guys. Packer Bugs of Philly. And some of the photos we saw today came are in this book as well. Um, and yeah, I'm going to make more copies. So let me know. Sign up on my website and I can let you know when that happens. All right. Doug just pointed out that uh, they need five days to, to go through the life cycle in a, in a bottle cap. Just five days. That's so quick. Yeah. 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 What What's uh the first bug of spring that you look forward to? What's a sign of spring when you know, ah, it's here? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, there are a couple of butterflies that come out early, like um, the morning cloak and the comma are, they overwinter as adults, which is very, rather unique. And so we do look for them. Um, and then, uh, I just look for anything, I guess. Anything flying, I'm like, yay! <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I just pointed out, I saw a cabbage white last week. I'm always disappointed wow. when it's a cabbage white that I see first. I always want to see the morning cloak. Big chocolate brown butterfly. Yeah, it's a great sight, spring. Um, Lila Bell has a question. Lila Bell, do you want to ask it? Ah, uh, Lila Bell, you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's not really a question, but it's, um, I have two reptiles as pets. And the other thing that I wanted to say was I, um, one time saw, um, it was either, um, a dragonfly. It was, a, I think it was dragonflies, um, one wanted to mate with the other one, but the but the other one didn't want to mate with it. One was trying to mate, and one was trying not to mate. Mm, that, that reptiles happens. are a leopard gecko and a hognose snake. Yep. <laughs> oh, cool. They must like to eat bugs, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, my leopard gecko eats the uh, horned worm, and eats crickets and um, cockroaches. Yum. Thank you, Lila. Bell. That's <laughs> great. For um, that. And uh, just chimed in. She teaches our kindergarten class in nature preschool. She says we saw morning cloak, cabbage whites, and spring azure this week at the school center. Wow. That's great. Awesome. Um, there was an early question way on. I forgot. Um, the question was way back when you started, are bees happy? Well, okay. bees been getting lots of attention. There's both, there's, there's kind of two answers because honeybees get lots of attention, but then Native bees have also recently got started getting lots of attention as well. Yeah, that's true. And that's a great way to put it too, because it is, they're two like overlapping, but also different issues because bees are domesticated. So there's two domesticated insects in the world and they are the silkworm moth, which creates the clothing that we're about to wear and scarves and other pretty things like that. And then there's also the honey bees and the honeybees that are in the USA, they're not even native as well, but they are struggling and they are being affected by a lot of the same things that the wild insects are being affected by too. But it's important to recognize that they are two separate things. And um, there's a lot of plants that, that like bumblebees, for example, can, can pollinate that honeybees cannot pollinate. And one of my favorite examples of that is buzz pollination. I, I recommend you guys look up buzz pollination. It's where the bumblebee goes up, um, and there's there's basically there's certain there's certain flowers that can only that only release their pollen when a certain frequency or vibration um, resonates next to them, and so the bumblebee goes up and hugs the flower and vibrates, and then the pollen is released. But honeybees are not able to do that. They don't know the secret password. You could call it. Um, it's just a really cool like magical thing in nature that exists, I think. That's great. Good. Um, Jade wants to know what your website is. Thebugandthebeetle.net is your website, right? Yeah. The bug and the beetle, all one word, right? Dot net. Yes. Right. And then how do we find your live channel? Um, 
you can find that also on there. It's called the bug scope and I have a page that has about an about page for it and also the schedule for it. So if you click into my website, you'll see at the top bar, um, it has the information there. Great. Yeah. Great. So he said, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for giving us this presentation on, on bugs. Um,